On this episode of Doing the Most, how to brew your first brew in a bag beer. Moment brews and various artists, everything from me to rose. Big creation, fermentation, and heat creation, doing the most. The mission of this video is simple. We're going to get you brewing brew in a bag now. We're going to do it for cheap and we're gonna have you with a beer in hand in four to five weeks. For this video, we're gonna do what's called a smash. That's a single malt, single hop beer. It's totally uncomplicated. The malted grain we're gonna use for this is called two row, and the hop we're gonna use for this is available everywhere. It's Centennial Hops. The biggest benefit to a smash is that it is simple. It's kind of difficult to screw up and it also gives you a little bit of room to play. You can play with different malts by zeroing in on that very specific malt profile. And I think that's the most valuable thing about brewing a single malt, single hop beer, is that if you use a base malt like Two Row, that's just like real chill, real middle of the road, real neutral, you can play with the gamut of hops and there are a kajillion different hops that you can play with and you can really hone in on what that hop profile smells like, what it tastes like and how it plays against that neutral malt. It gives you a really good understanding of what you're gonna get out of any particular hop. For this beer, we're gonna do a traditional one hour mash. That is a one hour period where you're steeping your grains in hot water to extract the starches and allow them to convert into fermentable sugars. And then instead of doing what is usually traditional, a one hour boil, we're gonna do a 30 minute boil and our hops are gonna go right in at the beginning of the boil. So there's no hop schedule here. You just bring it to a boil and yeet them in. Now, a long boil on your hops, like up to an hour, that's used to extract bittering. Whereas a shorter boil, like we're doing here, 30 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, is more for extracting flavor. And then a very short boil or no boil at all is used for extracting aromatic compounds. Here, we're kind of hitting middle of the road. We're doing a 30 minute boil, so we'll get some bittering and some flavors and just a touch of aromatics out of these Centennial hops. It should be a nice, easy drinking hops profile on this beer. I like to think of your boil on your hops a little bit like when you steep tea. If you steep tea for too long, you're gonna extract too much tannins. It's gonna be very astringent. It's gonna be kind of hard to drink. But if you steep it for just a little while, like the typical five minutes that you would steep tea, you still get some tannins, but you also get that nice big bold flavor. The flavor doesn't get obliterated by your steeping time. Hops are the same way. The longer you steep, the more bittering compounds, the less you steep, the more flavor and aromatic compounds. And neither of those is necessarily a bad thing. In fact, that's what a hop schedule is. It allows you to control for bittering and flavor and aromatics by adding different hops at different times. That said, again, we're not doing that here. We're just doing one hops addition right at the beginning of the boil to keep things simple. If you're watching this video, you might be very, very new to brew in a bag, all grain beer brewing, or maybe you've never brewed a beer at all. And so I think it's helpful to do a gear rundown of every piece of gear you're gonna see in this video. Brew kettle, gas burner, tank, and regulator. Brew bag, ratcheting pulley, instant read thermometer, probe thermometer, mash paddle, metal rack, Hop Spider, Brew Bucket and Airlock, Starzan Spray Bottle, Racking Cane, Tubing, Wort Chiller, Garden Hose and Adapter, Hydrometer, Bottling Wand, and Bottle Capper. Now that we've got all that out of the way, let's take a look at our ingredients. The ingredients for this beer are 10 pounds of two row, two ounces of Centennial hops, USO5 ale yeast, and seven gallons of water. Your brew day begins with a little bit of setup. We're brewing on a propane burner in the backyard here, and I'm using a ratcheting pulley to get my bag in and out of the brew kettle. We start with our water, and we're going to use seven gallons of water here. All seven gallons goes right in. Then we'll hook up our propane tank to our regulator. 
Important to note, you can usually get four to five beers out of a standard propane tank, and it's dependent on how long your boil is, but also how vigorous your boil is. You know, you don't need to have a really intense boil going on. It just needs to be hot enough that the liquid is at a rolling boil. So you really want to dial in your propane just to that point of a rolling boil and keep it there. You don't want to be burning off more gas than you need. Open that wide open. My lighter ran out of butane, so I'm lighting it with a match. And we'll check the temperature every so often with an instant read thermometer. Our recipe is simple. It's seven gallons of water, 10 pounds of two row, and two ounces of Centennial hops pellets. The grain is already milled. We had the local homebrew shop mill it for us, so it just needs to go into our brew bag. So I got this brew bag from my friends over at Northern Brewer and it's great. And one of the things you want to look for in a brew bag is a pretty big volume. You don't want to skimp on volume with your brew bag. Make sure it's something that, as you've seen in this video, can fill an entire brew bucket. That way you have plenty of room for lots and lots of grain should you need it. Another thing I like about this brew bag is it has handles. Those handles can go on my ratcheting pulley and it makes it really easy to get the bag in and out of my brew kettle. You really want your brew bag to be sturdy and ideally to be reusable many, many times. If you invest in a really nice, really good quality brew bag, you won't be replacing it a whole bunch of times and that will end up saving you money. We would like our strike water temperature to be 160 degrees. That's because the grain is gonna pull the temperature down a little bit and we would like to mash this in the range of about 153 to 155 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going for a light and low bodied beer here using a mash temperature in that mid-range of the spectrum ensures we'll have more fermentable sugars in our wort. Grain bag goes in. Want to really make sure that our grain bag is nice and saturated and we'll lower that in. Turn off our burner. It's not necessary to keep constant tabs on the temperature inside your bag. However, I'm going to use a probe thermometer here so I can keep an eye on it. And again, we're hoping for a mash temp in the mid 150s. About halfway through, open up your bag and stir your grain around. This just helps to break up any clumps that may have formed in there and increase your efficiency. Quite often I skip this step, but it is good practice. If your mash temperature drops into the lower 50s, it's okay to raise your bag up some and kick on the gas for a little bit in order to bring the liquid temperature back up. Here I just burned a little propane for a couple minutes until the temperature in our bag came up to the mid 150s. With 15 minutes to go, open that bag up and stir a little bit more. And then at the end of our one hour mash, we'll lift that bag up and drain it. The Brew Show, a friend of our channel, has a great tip of using a rack to help drain your bag. And here we're just using a cooling rack. And with a couple of gloved hands, we'll squeeze that bag out to get as much of the liquid out of the grain as we can. Be careful, this is pretty hot. So we started out with seven gallons of water here, and we're gonna end up with five gallons of beer on the other end of that. That's because our grain absorbed a bunch of the water. Actually, over a gallon of our liquid was absorbed into the grain, and that's just liquid we're never gonna get back. And then a little bit more of our liquid boiled off. It evaporated and it's gone. So in doing brew in a bag or any sort of all grain beer brewing, you plan for that eventuality. And so we started with a couple of extra gallons of water, so that way we know that we'll get to that five gallons we want on the other end of things. 
After that was done, I spread the grain in the yard for our backyard chickens. The chickens really enjoy those spent grains. Then I took my pulley system down, and it's time for us to turn on the gas and get that burner going one more time. When our wort has come up to a rolling boil, it's now time to put in our hops spider. The hop spider is basically a big strainer for our hops to keep those hops chunks from floating around inside of our wort. As you can see here, we put in our hop spider after the boil has begun. We're waiting for some of that hot break to occur where you start to see stuff come up and float on the surface. The reason we wait that long is because if you put your hop spider in right as you start to bring it up to a boil, some of the proteins and stuff in there can lock up the mesh of your hop spider. So if you wait until after that's happened and then put the hop spider in, you're at a lower risk of your hop spider getting clogged up and preventing a good flow of liquid in there to extract out of those hops all the things that you're trying to get. I can't take credit for this. I learned this from Reddit a while back. So thank you, anonymous Redditor, whoever you are for that tip. It's a real headache saver. And we're gonna be doing a 30 minute boil here. So our hops will go right in at the beginning. With 15 minutes to go, we're going to put our wort chiller in. This will sanitize the wort chiller for us. Let that boil away. You might be able to tell from this footage that my wort chiller is homemade. It was made by wrapping a very long piece of copper tubing around the outside of a five gallon corny keg. And if you're looking to make a wort chiller of your own, I would suggest doing it the same way. Don't skimp on your wort chiller. It's one of the most valuable pieces of equipment in your home brewing arsenal. At the end of our 30 minute boil, we will connect our wort chiller to the garden hose, cut the gas to the burner, and turn that garden hose on. That cold water will run through that copper pipe and cool our wort down to yeast pitching temperature. With our wort chiller going, we will pull out our hop spider and strain out our hops. If you have dogs, don't dump those hops in the yard. If dogs eat hops, it can be very bad for them. Now it's important to make sure that everything that touches your beer is sanitized. So here we're sanitizing our instant read thermometer and just keeping an eye on our temperature so we know when it's time to transfer it to our bucket. Now that we've hit 85 degrees, it's a great time to transfer this off. So we will sanitize everything, attach our tubing, and open our valve and transfer away. And after we're done transferring, we will turn off the water to our wort chiller. and we will be pitching USO5 yeast. Sanitize all the things, open that yeast packet up, and we're dumping it right in. Our starting gravity on this was 1.047. Bring the bucket inside, place an airlock on top, and let it ride. The next day it was already bubbling away. After two weeks, fermentation had finished and all of our yeast had dropped to the bottom. So it's time to get this primed and bottled. Here I'm priming this with four ounces of sucrose. That's just regular old table sugar. Often beer kits will come with dextrose to prime your bottles. You can use dextrose as well, but table sugar is readily accessible and that's often what I use. We'll just mix that into this boiling water until it's crystal clear 
and let that cool to room temperature. Once that's cooled down considerably, we'll put it into the bottom of our carboy and get a clean rack. You could also do your clean rack into a bottling bucket instead of a carboy, and that way you wouldn't have to wait for your priming sugar solution to cool down. But a carboy is what I had available this day. Our final gravity on this batch was 1.005. So we put our racking cane in, making sure to keep it above the stuff that has settled out in the bottom. As you can gather here, I'm not a big fan of the auto siphon. I prefer a traditional racking cane. We'll move that up to the workbench, attach our bottling wand. The bottling wand has a valve at the bottom that opens up when you press down. And so we just press down on our bottling wand inside that bottle and it will fill it from the bottom. This minimizes oxygen exposure to the beer. This made about 48 bottles, two of which went to my local homebrew shop. Since this was a new malt to them, I wanted them to be able to taste the flavor profile in this single malt, single hop beer. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of details in this tasting because this is like the most simple beer you could possibly make. It's a great, easy drinking beginner beer. It'd be good for folks who like light beers or, you know, like Michelob Ultra or Coors Banquet. Really uncomplicated beers, but something that's really easy to sip and, and really approachable. I pitched the yeast into this beer five weeks ago and now it's bottle conditioned and ready. Being bottle conditioned and still a little young, it's still got a delicate haze to it. But you know, if you let that sit long enough in your fridge, all that would cold crash out. It's just a touch maltier than commercial light beers might be. And I wouldn't call this a light beer. It's, it's definitely not brewed to be low calorie, but I use that terminology because that helps describe kind of the flavor profile on this. And now it is a bit hoppier. Like I said, you get just that extra touch of bittering and then right on your exhale, there's a nice floral note from the hop that just kind of, you, can, you just kind of breathe it out as you exhale the beer. Let you know there's hops in there. Is it the world's tastiest beer? Subjective, but is it inexpensive and approachable and stupid easy to brew? Absolutely. You can follow us on Instagram and join our Discord server and you know, check out all the things that are here on your screen. And thank you for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and go down there and click that subscribe button below the video. Ring that bell for notifications. We do new content every Friday here on the channel, so you don't want to miss it. So ring that bell. I hope this video was helpful. I hope it was simple. That was the whole goal is to make a simple, simple, approachable brew in a bag beer video that kind of covers all the steps and all the need to know information but doesn't hit you with a ton of lingo and specialized gear and all that until next time happy brewing cheers stay well stay safe and drink good beer